The final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 14128 in the name of Sandra White on As Gaza Withers, Its People Perish. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons now, please. I call on Sandra White to open the debate. Seven minutes, please. Presiding officer, uh, I am aware that uh, previous debates we have had involving Palestine and Israel tend to become somewhat polarised or conflated with wider issues rather than focus on the motion at hand. And I do understand that as, as people are so passionate about this issue. However, when I tabled this motion for debate, it was primarily in response to the United Nations Trade and Development Board report into developments in the economy of the occupied Palestinian territories. And whilst I acknowledge that since the publication of the report, other events have inflamed an already volatile situation, I would ask the members contributing this evening to remain mindful of the motion at hand rather than perhaps some of the wider issues which we all acknowledge do exist. Presiding officer, let us be clear, this is about people. This is about a humanitarian crisis which has been unfolding, is unfolding before our eyes. And regardless of where we sit in the debate, Regarding the ongoing situation between the state of Palestine and the state of Israel, we cannot ignore or turn a blind eye to their plight. For the record, presiding officer, and for the avoidance of doubt, I reference the state of Palestine in accordance with UN Security Council Resolution 1397, adopted in 2002, in which it is affirmed the vision of a Palestinian and Israeli state two-state solution. Before the publication of the UN report, the World Bank in May published its economic monitoring report into the Palestinian territories, which also provided some grim and damning reading. In this section, the destruction of Gaza's economy, human consequences and the way forward, the World Bank states that it has been tremendously damaged by repeated armed conflicts, the blockade and internal divide. It goes on to state that income is 31% lower than it was 20 years ago, its manufacturing sector, which some may find unusual, was once very, very significant in Gaza. It shrunk by 60% and that Gaza's exports have virtually disappeared since the imposition of the blockade. Nothing can explain this other than war and blockade. The report goes on to say that the human costs of Gaza's economic malaise are enormous. Compared to that of other economies, unemployment in Gaza would be the highest in the world and poverty in Gaza is also extremely high. These numbers, however, fail to portray the degree of suffering of Gaza citizens due to poor electricity, water and sewage availability. War-related psychological trauma, limited movement and other adverse effects of wars and the blockade. According to the World Bank, the way forward requires a unified Palestinian government in both West Bank and Gaza, which can be a partner to multilateral and bilateral donors and substantial donor support to rebuild Gaza's infrastructure and homes. And it requires the lifting of the blockade on the movement of goods and people to allow Gaza's tradable sectors to recover. It's important to note that these are not my words, but are taken directly from the World Bank report. And this is what we must remember when we debate these issues. It's not simply a question of individuals stating these facts, but authoritative world bodies which are actually stating these facts. The UN report paints a similar bleak picture highlighting the dramatic effect of Israel's withholding of Palestinian clearance revenues, which are VAT and import duties collected by the government of Israel <clears throat> on behalf of the Palestinian Authority and normally remitted monthly, minus charges for electricity, water, sewage, health, referrals and a 3% administration fee. These essential revenues, which represent 75% of to total revenue, were once again withheld for the first four months of 2015, causing severe financial difficulties for the Palestinian authorities and, of course, the people of Palestine. We might ask ourselves, or indeed we might believe that this revenue was withheld for good reason by the government of Israel. However, it was as a result of the Palestinian National Authority's application by the State of Palestine for membership of the International Criminal Court. Some may see this as a collective punishment for the exercising international rights, 
but could it be an isolated incident? The answer is yes and no. Yes, it was collective punishment, and no, it was not isolated. In 2000, revenue was withheld for two years following the start of the Second Intifada. In 2006, it was withheld for one and a half years following Palestinian elections. In May 2011, it was withheld for one month following efforts at Palestinian national reconciliation. And the list could go on. The report also acknowledges that despite claims to the contrary, much of the hardship faced are not as a result of inadequate leadership, as in fact the economy of Palestine is one of an occupied territory and is undermined by occupation rather than policies pursued or poor donor co coordination. As a motion states, the UN reports notes that three Israeli military operations in the past six years, in addition to eight years of economic blockade, have ravaged their already debilitated infrastructure of Gaza. Shattered its productive base, left no time for meaningful re reconstruction or economic recovery, and impoverished the Palestinian population in Gaza, rendering their economic well-being worse than the level of two periods decades before. In October 2014, during a visit to Gaza, the Secretary General of the United Nations stated the destruction was beyond description. And this, for me, is the true cost of the Israeli government's policies towards Gaza, the cost of the people living there. It's estimated that 360,000 are in dire need of treatment for mental health conditions. And with regards to children, Gaza's future, 400,000 are in need of immediate psychosocial support and psychological, obviously, support as well. Also, the Middle East process, when the UN Special Coordinator visited there in April, said no human being who visits can remain untouched by the terrible devastation that one sees here in Gaza. And as shocking as the devastation of the buildings might be, the devastation of the people is ten times more shocking. And that's why I'm heartened uh, by the number of Israelis, Palestinians, Jews and non-Jews alike who wish to see a peaceful resolution to this situation and who condemn violence and extremism in any form, as do I. However, it is vitally important we continue to speak out against these injustices and we continue to strive for a real peace deal. I know that the Scottish Government has today been strong in being one of these voices and I commend it for doing so. However, can we do more? I do think so. I think Scotland is in a unique situation to offer its services to both sides, should they wish it. There's nothing stopping us from looking to bring representatives together to discuss in an informal and neutral setting how we can go forward in order to achieve a just and lasting peace. And I would be happy to work with the Minister and anyone else, I'm sure others would too, to look at ways of bringing Scotland's wise council to the table and stop the terrible destruction in Gaza and in Palestine. Thank you, President Officer. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. A number of members are indicating they would wish to speak. Speeches of four minutes, please. Claudia Beamish to be followed by John Finney. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, it is essential that the Scottish Parliament plays its part in keeping injustice of the Palestinian plight in the public eye. So I very much thank Sandra White for bringing this wide-ranging motion to the Chamber and for her comprehensive analysis today. In the short time I have, I want to focus on one part of her motion. Supports those Israelis, Palestinians, Jews and non-Jews alike from Glasgow, Scotland and around the world who believe in mutual respect and understanding as cornerstones to a just solution in Palestine and Israel. When re-elected in 2013, speaking to Parliament, Mr Netanyahu repeated a pledge to make, I quote, a historic compromise in order to make peace with the Palestinians. And I further quote, with a Palestinian partner who is willing to conduct negotiations in good faith, Israel will be prepared for a historic compromise that will end the conflict for the, Pal for the Palestinians forever. The coalition in Israel includes Mr. Netanyahu's party, the centrist Yes Adid party, and the right-wing Jewish Home Party. The lineup includes a strong showing of pro-settlement ministers. This shows the ir irresolvable tension within the Israeli government and the sending of mixed messages. There is an ancient Chinese expression, Wu Zi Bu Li, which means without trust, nothing stands. Trust must, of course, be based on truth. 
I first learnt the plight of the Palestinians from my father, who was a regular soldier in the British Army based in Bethlehem during the Mandate. Because he witnessed the injustice of the settlement, he was an advocate for the Palestinian state and for the support of refugees throughout his political life as an MP. Sixty years later, there is a collective amnesia still about the historic, historic facts by many Israelis, though of course not all, as demonstrated by the governments that they elect. And indeed, too often other governments and people across the world fail to understand this truth. Here in the Scottish Parliament, the Balfour Project held an exhibition recently and will host a conference in Durham at the end of this week, promoting their film, The British in Palestine, 1917-48, to continue to raise awareness of the British, British mandate. And I quote the words of the project, a homeland for the Jewish people has been achieved, but the leagues, that's the League of Nations, trust to facilitate Palestinian independence is still to be fulfilled. Another film, On the Side of the Road, directed and written by Leah Chakakansky, focuses on the collective uh, denial of the events of 48. She is an Israeli who grew up in a settlement in the West Bank and now has come to understand the Israeli occupation and its implication for Palestinians. As well as telling of her awakening, the film tells the story of Triva Tong Parnas and Enon Oinman, two war veterans, as they tackle their denial of their actions in the war against Palestine. Sandra White and I were interviewed here in the Scottish Parliament by the director for an introduction to the film. And as co-conveners of the cross-party group for Palestine, along with uh, Jim Hume and Sandra Urquhart, I know, sorry, um, uh, Jean, Jean Urquhart, I know that the CPG is determined to contribute to exposing the truth of the injustice too. Initiatives to build the mutual respect and understanding are essential, and there are many. One such is the West Eastern Divan Orchestra, founded by Daniel Barenboim and, and Edward Said. And the aim of the orchestra is to promote the understanding between Israelis and Palestinians and pave the way for a peaceful and fair solution. In these and so many other ways, which we don't have time to go into today, young people in Israel can surely start to understand the essence of that Chinese proverb. They are the Israeli electorate of the future. Of course, this is only a small part of working towards a just solution, but I believe it is a significant one. Without trust, nothing stands, but the trust must be based on truth. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call John Finney, who will be followed by Kenny McCaskill. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I congratulate um, Sandra White on this motion. And um, here we are again discussing Gaza, and uh, um, it's not in the positive terms we'd like to be. Uh, we, of course, welcome the UN report. It is a, an authoritative world body, as Sandra White referred to. But I have to say the content will surprise no one. Um, it should, this discussion should be about people and, and the effect. Uh, and, and eight years of blockade, as has been alluded to, three, years, three wars and six years, and the strange phrase, accelerated de-development of Gaza Strip. I mean, clearly there's human consequences. It's, it was talked about and often in abstract terms, but the blockade is, blockade is very real. There are 1.8 million Palestinians, and that's expected to grow to 2.1 million by 2020. The motion talks about justice, and that's what I would like to focus on. I'm going to talk later briefly about the divestment programme. I first want to talk about the arms trade. The arms trade the world over has a, a pernicious effect on humanity. It's not an issue for others. It's an issue for Scotland. It's an issue for now. Uh, Sandra White asked, what can we do more? Well, I think what we can do is we commend, can commend the Scottish Government for the support shown to Gaza, but we can also legitimately criticise the Scottish Government, who last month gave £2.5 million to a military corporation that made $3.614 billion profit. That's the corporation called Lockheed Martin, and I looked at their website today, and it says, and I quote, Lockheed Martin is, a, is proud of the significant role it has fulfilled in the security of the State of Israel. The company is proud of the C-130 and F-16 aircraft that have faithfully, are faithfully served in the Israel Air Force since the 1970s and 1980s. £2.5 million pounds could have done a lot of good in Gaza. Um, I, I looked at one of the many uh, aid organisations that were providing assistance there. 
And one of them said, and I quote, many families in Gaza are literally on the breadline, unable to cover the basic costs of living. Our family sponsorship project will help 120 displaced families with rent, food and medical expenses and they encourage you to sponsor a family a month for £200. That sum of money would be nine years' support for that group, nine years of support for these families. Now, of course, it's not alone with that particular company. We have the, the Raytheon and, and Glen Rothes and its involvement there. And whilst some of us will be uncomfortable uh, with talk of that and the arms trade and the fact that, indeed, the white paper mentioned the, the, the growth of the arms trade in Scotland, we must link our firm, fine words about um, peaceful resolution and humanity with our deeds. Um, so I'd encourage people to effectively support uh, Gaza through boycotts, divestment and sanctions. That's a movement that started in 2005. It was ins inspired by South Africa. And there's an example of where you can see positive development. Um, Israel's regime is one of occupation, colonialism and apartheid. And it is attacking the basics of living. Um, um, actions speak louder than words, so let's, let's speak by our actions. And uh, shamefully, our own parliamentary pension scheme has increased 35% in the last two years. Its investment now over half a million in arms companies. So that's something we need to do. We need to continue to condemn the collective punishment, and we must stop. I have to say the side I'm on. I'm on the side of proper housing for everyone, proper health, and including the mental health for everyone, proper water supply for everyone, a positive future for everyone. And that's nothing to do with race, religion or geography. Um, I'm happy to condemn violence. And I think it's discussion and words and debate like this that will move things forward. And I congratulate <coughs> excuse me, Sandra White for bringing the debate. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Kenny McCaskill to be followed by Jamie McGregor. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too would like to thank uh, uh, and congratulate Sandra White for bringing this uh, debate. I know that she's been a relentless campaigner for the cause of the Palestinian people, uh, both here and indeed uh, visiting there. But I also think it's important that she raises this particular report. This isn't a report from uh, those that would be accused of being uh, standard bearers for the Palestinian cause. It's not simply a United Nations organisation, but it's a trade and development board. Uh, people who are looking at it, not necessarily from the point of view of the rights and wrongs that go back over generations in the Middle East, but are coming at the point of view from an economic involvement, uh, from the practical developments that it has upon the civic structure, the civic society and the humanity that live there, and therefore it has to be taken cognizance of. It deserves far more uh, reporting than it has to date, and I think she does a great service in ensuring that it's raised in this parliament. I want to concentrate on two particular issues. First of all, the nature of the conflict that we're seeing in Gaza, because what we have is a low-intensity war in a high-density population. And the nature of the conflict has ebbed and flowed as intifadas have come and gone, as rockets have rained down. Uh, sometimes it's been uh, uh, very low intensity, sometimes it's been very high intensity. But it has been waged upon people, not simply from land, but by sea, and by air, because Gaza is surrounded on all sides and dealt with quite harshly uh, by Israeli defence forces. And we also have to remember that it is a very small area. Uh, some, as John Finney mentioned, 1.8 million people living in 360 square kilometres, 25 miles long at its highest, and between 3.7 and 7.5 miles wide at its uh, widest points. Uh, those people are suffering as a war is pursued at whatever uh, level. It varies in intensity, but it has been ongoing, and the deaths and injuries are significant. There are, of course, bases in which Israel will say that they are attacked and rockets come out, and I put on record my condemnation of the rockets that are fired into Israeli civilian areas uh, by those from there. But I think it has to be said, that, first of all, the response by Israel is entirely disproportionate and goes way, way beyond what could ever be countenanced. And secondly, as anybody can tell you, if you put a cat in a corner, then it will scratch. And if you treat the people in Gaza like that, then nothing else can be expected. It, but it's not just the damage and the loss of life. This report that Sandra White has raised here in, 19, in 2014, uh, the operation carried out there resulted in 18,000 housing units destroyed or severely damaged. 
26 schools destroyed, 122 damaged, 15 hospitals and 45 primary health centres damaged. They are wiping out the infrastructure that civic society requires in Gaza to be able to survive. And that takes me on to the second point, because what Israel has created there is in all intents and purposes a Bantu stand. It is a society that cannot be expected to live as it is because it requires to have access to areas beyond its borders that have been encroached upon by Israel. It's not simply the access to employment, because unemployment is massive there. 80% for young women, 44% for the whole of the society. But it's access for basic matters such as water, because the water doesn't come from within the Gaza area, but it comes from without. And that's why, as I'm conscious of time, we have to realise that civic society, in the limited space that Israel has allowed the Palestinian people in Gaza, cannot be sustained. The final warning from that Trade and Development Board report for the United Nations was that if this continues and the Palestinian population rise to 2.1 million, by the time we get to 2020, and that is only five years away, then life will not be tolerable in Gaza. Things have to change. Israel has to allow Gaza to be able to live, develop and breathe and to have a civic society that can be maintained. Many thanks. I now call Jamie McGregor to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Um, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too congratulate Sandra White on securing today's debate. Um, like the UK government, I readily recognise the severe suffering of the inhabitants of Gaza and want to see urgent action to alleviate the impact of occupation and improve the humanitarian situation. All of us must feel real sympathy for their plight. The UK is one of the leading international donors in terms of supporting the much-needed reconstruction efforts in Gaza and providing significant amounts of emergency assistance. We have provided $350 million from the UK to build Palestinian institutions, deliver essential services and relieve the humanitarian situation. I'm not saying that this is enough. We believe other international donors should fulfil in full the financial pledges they have made to provide support to Gaza, as the UK is doing. And it's hugely disappointing that only about a third of the international aid promised at the 2014 Cairo conference in Palestine, reconstructing Gaza, as it was called, has so far been delivered. And we are pleased that Israel has taken some steps to ease the restrictions in Gaza, but we want to see more done to allow an increase in exports from Gaza expand water supplies, which Kenny McCaskill just mentioned, um, and ease further the restrictions on, one, the movement of people, fishing, electricity, and water waste treatment. It can't be acceptable to anybody that power outages in Gaza last for up to 12 hours per day, and 120,000 are still without a water supply. But we can believe, too, that some action is needed from both sides, and so we continue to call on the Palestinian Authority, led by President Abbas, to take steps to return to Gaza and advance reconciliation. The Palestinians must also take steps to address Israel's significant and legitimate security concerns. We should all recognize Israel has faced an unacceptable barrage of rockets from Hamas and other militant groups, and that it is unsustainable Israel, Israeli people can't be expected uh, just to do nothing in the face of aggressive missiles. At the end of the day, the aspirations of the Palestinian people cannot be fully realized until there is an end to the occupation, and that will come only through negotiations, however hard that might be, however far away from a negotiated settlement we might be, and I recognize recent events, suffering and violence on both sides make it seem an even harder task. A negotiated two-state solution and a resolution, through, a resolution through peaceful means is the only way of achieving any sustainable long-term outcome for the region. Making progress towards the two-state solution remains a foreign policy priority for the UK. The international community must strive harder than ever to work with both sides to find a comprehensive peace agreement that delivers an independent Palestine alongside a safe and secure Israel. We must not lose sight of this aim, 
and all of us, including members in this parliament, should support it and urge both sides to commit to meaningful talks. There is no alternative. And like Sander White, I pray that wise counsel of Solomonic proportions will prevail and that the mutual respect and understanding which she mentions in her motion do lay the cornerstones for a happier future. Thank you. Many thanks. Before I continue with the debate and due to the number of members who still wish to speak, I'm minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 from Sandra White that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Would you care to move? Move the motion. Please Many move thanks. Um, I'm going to put this motion to the Chamber. I don't think we'll need 30 minutes, but I don't want to curtail debate. So is that agreed? It is. Thank you. I now call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by John Mason. Uh, President Officer, can I first apologise for having to leave uh, very soon because I'm chairing the cross-party group on rare diseases, which was actually due to start at 5.30, but can't start till I am there. But can I congratulate Sandra White on uh, bringing forward this uh, motion and reminding us uh, once again of the desperate situation uh, in Gaza, and it's graphically described, of course, in the UN Conference uh, on Trade and Development uh, report. And many of the facts, of course, have already been uh, uh, described, but I think it's important to keep stating these facts and to remind people uh, of them, because, of course, many people wish perhaps to uh, put them from their minds. 1.8 million Palestinians live in Gaza, and over 80% are aid-dependent, living in poverty, and 61% are food insecure. There is no chance to grow a viable economy as the vital materials needed to plant crops and rebuild infrastructure are stopped at the checkpoints. For example, Global Shelter Cluster, who work with bodies like UNCHR to house displaced people, estimate that less than 1% of the construction materials required to rebuild houses destroyed and damaged during hostilities have so far entered Gaza. There is no growth, no renewal and no jobs. In 2014, the unemployment rate was 43%, the highest in the world, and youth unemployment exceeded 60%. This should not have been allowed to continue for so long, and it is a crime against multiple articles in the Geneva Convention that Israel has perpetuated these conditions. As an occupying force, they have, asked the policy, they have used the policy of separation and the illegal blockade to rip apart the economy, severing the links between Gaza and the West Bank and blocking off the important economic and cultural ties that once defined a vibrant people. Under Article 33 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, it states that the collective punishment of a civilian population is a war crime. And what we are seeing now with the population on the brink of starvation has been described as such by the EU and the UN. It is in contravention of Israel's obligations under international humanitarian law. And it is a mark of shame on the international community that many turn their heads to it, don't turn their heads to it until the next rocket is fired or the next aerial assault is launched. The crisis in Gaza is a slow daily march towards utter devastation, with each war bringing unlivable reality closer. Those bright and hopeful children deserve better, and their voices must be heard in making the case for change. There is a different story to be told of Gaza and her people, one of potential, of resilience, and a tenacity to grasp hope in the ruins of despair. Gaza's children are among the most literate in the Arab world, and they are imbued with a passion for learning. The culture and tradition of their land, the close connection to the sea and to the tending of their crops, survives in the pages of their books. The height of their ambition is matched only by the height of the walls that lock them in. Such is the nature of this conflict. Presiding officer, natural gas is just one area that could help rebuild Gaza's economic structure. There are many, many other examples in the agricultural sector, in house building, in teaching, in medicine and fishing. There is nothing more heartbreaking than seeing the old men at the waterfront of Gaza City looking out to the sea where they have fished for generations. They stare out to sea knowing that the maritime blockade at three nautical miles is marked with Israeli military vessels that have been known to shoot at boats and destroy nets. The fear and sadness is worn into their faces. They are losing hope for themselves and for future generations. Israel must lift the blockade immediately. They must honour their obligations as an occupying force in the occupied Palestinian territories. They must then allow a sustainable economy to grow and lift the land out of its current crisis. If they do not, then further political deterioration and conflict will be inevitable. The enormity of this crisis cannot be overestimated, and I join with others in this chamber today calling for the international community to put pressure on Israel as a matter of immediate priority. Many thanks.
I now call John Mason to be followed by Cara Hilton. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and I thank <coughs> Sandra White uh, for bringing this debate today. And I have to say, I think a slightly more conciliatory tone in her speech than I had detect detected in the uh, debate in the motion itself. I have to say, I was not particularly wanting to speak in this debate because I have spoken before on Israel and Palestine, and I think I've made my position fairly clear. That position is that I believe we should be doing all we can, whether that be Scotland, the UK or the EU, to bring about peace in the Middle East. I do not believe peace will be brought about by giving unqualified support to either side. Uh, I also do not think we can achieve peace in the region without involving other players, such as Iran and Egypt. To suggest that the problems in Gaza are solely linked to Israel and Palestine is just not the case. However, in reading this motion, I did feel that I should speak with the hope of giving a slightly different angle uh, from the back benches. Uh, this is a subject which stirs a lot of emotion on both sides, but hopefully our, we are mature enough as a parliament to accept that there are two sides to this argument and both sides have a degree of validity in their cause. I would just like to focus on a few words uh, that appear in the motion. Uh, one is justice or a just solution, and I certainly hope that we do all support justice. Uh, but justice in its own can be quite a harsh concept. It is one of the words in our mace in this parliament, but it's not the only word. And compassion is another word on the mace. And I do think we need both of them when we're talking about Israel and Gaza. Uh, with ourselves, I think we should be looking at the situation seeking both justice with compassion. And I think we should be encouraging both sides uh, to be seeking uh, justice along with compassion for the other side. The second word, and perhaps the key word why I felt I had to speak today, was the use of the word genocide in the motion. Now, it's a strong word, and I do not think we should use it lightly. I think we all are prepared to use it of the Nazis during the Holocaust in relation to their treatment of both Jews and other groups. I'm, uh, yes, okay. Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much for taking an intervention. I just wanted to read out what the dictionary definition is of uh, genocide. It is deliberate killing or elimination of all of part of racial, ethnic, religious, cultural or national group. I think that's what's been happening in Gaza. And I make no excuse or apology for using the word genocide in this manner. John Mason. OK, well, I'll continue what I was going to say, which I think will answer or at least uh, respond to Sandra White's point. I myself did use the word genocide in a motion I lodged about the Armenians in Turkey in 1915, and that provoked a strong response from the Turkish consulate in Scotland. So it is a word that we can and should use where appropriate, but I think we need to be careful not to use it too loosely. Genocide is also defined in Article 2 of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide from 1948 as, quote, any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial or religious group, unquote, and it goes on to give more examples. Now, the Nazis did intend to destroy the Jews, but I do not think there is any evidence or serious suggestion that Israel intends to destroy the Palestinians. And this is not just an academic debate we are engaged in today. Criticism of Israel may not be intended to be an attack on the Jews, but in practice it can be perceived that way. The Jews in Glasgow and the west of Scotland tell us that they feel more threatened at the present time than they have done in living memory. I'm not here today to defend the Israeli government and its actions. They are well able to do that themselves. But I think we need to decide what our aim is when we're having debates like this, and more generally when we are considering the Middle East situation. I hope we want to do all we can to bring peace to that region, and I hope we want to be as supportive as we can be towards Jews living in Scotland. And the final word, which I do very much agree with, is the final phrase uh, in the motion uh, that talks about wise counsel will prevail. Wisdom is also one of the words in our mace, and I very much hope that we can see more of that in relation to both Israel and Gaza. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call Cara Hilton. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I congratulate Sandra White on securing tonight's debate? Um, and also declare an interest as a member of the Scottish-Palestine Solidarity Campaign. 
Last week, Sandra White and I met together with Jim Malone and representatives of the Fire Brigade Union to discuss the current situation in Gaza and across Palestine. And I'd like to begin by wishing Jim and his colleagues well on their trip to Palestine later this week to support Palestinian firefighters in Nablus, Ramallah and Hebron and Israeli fi firefighters in West Jerusalem and to complete their documentary, Firefighters Under the Occupation. I know that the Minister and indeed the Scottish Government are supportive of their visit and I hope that all across the Chamber will wish them well. It's just over a year since the Israeli Government's Operation Protective Edge destroyed the lives homes, schools, hospitals and livelihoods of thousands of men, women and children in Gaza. And after eight years of Israeli blockades, the United Nations Development Agency report says that almost all the population of Gaza have been left destitute, warning that Gaza could be uninhabitable within just five years. Last year's war not only killed 2,200 Palestinians, including 556 children, it displaced half a million people and left much of Gaza in ruins. According to the report, 20,000 Palestinian homes were destroyed or damaged, 148 schools, 15 hospitals, 48 healthcare centres, 247 factories, factories 300 commercial centres fully or partially destroyed. Gaza's only power station sustained severe damage. Israel's three military operations over just six years, together with the economic blockade of Gaza, mean the economic recovery is simply impossible. And it's therefore no surprise to learn that Gaza now has the highest unemployment rate in the world, standing at 43%. Kenny McCaskill highlighted the point before about 8 out of 10 women being out of work as a result of this. A staggering 95% of the population in Gaza don't have access to clean, safe drinking water. 72% of households are affected by food insecurity, with more than half receiving food aid. The economic blockade imposed by Israel has devastated Gaza, isolating its people from the outside world, forcing Gaza and its population to rely on international aid. More than half of the population in Gaza are under the age of 18, and thanks to the blockade, these children, who should have everything to look forward to, have been denied the very basic essentials of life, collectively punished for being Palestinians, and denied the basic human rights that every child should have and does have under international law. Uh, Deputy President Officer, the time has come for governments to take e effective economic and political action to ensure compliance with international law, to force the Israeli government to lift the blockade in Gaza and to halt the illegal settlements and the bulldozing of Palestinian homes, to end the apartheid policies which are destroying people's lives and to, to start respecting the, the rights and the dignity of the Palestinian people, to take real action to ensure a two-state solution that res respects the security, peace and freedom of both the Palestinian and Israeli population. Sadly, the comments made we've seen by President Netanyahu in recent days and weeks doesn't inspire me with much hope of progress. One of my constituents, Mia O'Day, has hit the headlines in the Herald and the National today with a powerful letter to J.K. Rowling highlighting why a campaign of boycott, disinvestment and sanctions is essential if we are to peacefully encourage Israel to comply with international law. And I would urge all members who have not already read it to read her letter today. I hope that the Scottish Government will look at using the powers of procurement and divestment to support the Palestinian people and to address the issues raised by John Finney in relation to the arms trade, to our pension funds and to support for companies like Raytheon and Fife. I would encourage consumers to use their purchasing power to boycott Israeli goods and to send a message to Israel, just as we did to South Africa, that is enough, enough is enough. This isn't about taking sides, this is about human rights, it's about justice and about, it's about peace. And every day that we don't act, both the Palestinian and the Israeli people are paying the price of that failure. We've got to use every influence that we have to make it clear to Israel that the blockades, the settlements, the collective punishment, the breaches of international law have got to stop. My time's running out in the debate, just as time is running out for the people of Gaza unless we act. So thanks again to Sandra White for securing this important debate tonight. Many thanks. And can I now call on Hamza Youssef to respond to the debate, please, Minister. Seven minutes or so, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank uh, Sandra White for the motion uh, that she brought uh, to Parliament. I also congratulate her on her speech, which I thought was uh, very measured uh, in the tone and sticking, of course, to that important issue of the, the, the UN report. And also for congratulating members across the Chamber who I thought took a very measured tone in what can be an often, quite rightly and understandably, uh, emotive uh, issue. Presiding Officer, attempts to resolve uh, the situation in Israel and Palestine have been underway for more than twice the time I have been alive, 60 years, and the argument could be made, unfortunately, that we are uh, as far away and as distant as ever 
to a peaceful resolution. That is a damning indictment on the international community and a damning indictment uh, on us all. The deadlock brings devastating human consequences, as many members here have highlighted. We've seen, of course, uh, the incitement uh, and we've seen the uh, upsurge in that violence in the last few weeks. Dozens of people have been killed, hundreds wounded in the latest wave of hostilities alone. The Scottish Government unreservedly condemns all acts of violence, which have a party they're perpetrated by Muslim, Christian, Jewish, atheist, Palestinian or Israeli. It does not matter that the death of an innocent person, of course, is to be condemned and mourned in equality. Palestinians and Israeli deserve peace and stability. Uh, but as Sandra White's motion highlights, even during periods of relative calm, that isn't the reality for hundreds of thousands of people in the region. The UN report, which the motion focuses on, cites and makes for troubling reading. Gaza's economy has been battered by years of blockade and successive military offences. Uh, socio-economic conditions are at their lowest point since 1967. And unemployment in Gaza is at its highest level on record. Hamas are, of course, not blameless party at all, with a recent UN report accusing them of war crimes for which they must answer. But the bleakness of the situation is undoubtedly exacerbated by the fact that last summer's military assault did enormous damage to Gaza's infrastructure, to the very assets that could help, otherwise help local people to rebuild their economy and move towards self-sufficiency. Hospitals, health centres, schools, uh, sewage infrastructure, homes have been destroyed or damaged in significant number, causing living conditions to deteriorate further and, as Cara Hilton and others have said, making Gaza almost uninhabitable. So I agree with Sandra White that the situation in Gaza is... Uh, unsustainable. I would go as far as this government believes that in fact Gaza is being turned into an open air prison, the largest in the world. The Scottish government unequivocally condemns in the strongest possible manner the collective punishment of the people of Gaza. The UN report underlines the urgent need, of course, for political progress. There has been some high level progress since the report was published in July. Last month, for example, St Lucia became the largest country, the latest country, sorry, to recognise. Palestine as a state, which means that 136 of the 193 UN members now recognise Palestine. Two-thirds of the world's countries recognise Palestine as a state. It's no secret that the Scottish Government believes that the UK should join that number. It's a logical fallacy, it's an inconsistency of the highest order to say that you believe in a two-state solution while refusing to recognise one of the states involved. The UK Government should change that stance immediately. Uh, these may be viewed as symbolically important steps, but they don't in themselves improve necessarily the situation on the ground for those in Gaza. To secure a lasting peace in Israel and Palestine and thereby uh, stability and prosperity for the people who live there, a sustainable negotiated settlement is needed. Yet meaningful peace talks have stalled and faith that they can deliver is faltering amongst local people. I read uh, with interest, uh, according to a survey carried out last month by the Palestinian Centre, for policy and survey research that fewer than half the people in Gaza support the peace process and fewer than 27% believe that negotiations are the most effective approach to secure a Palestinian state. These are developments the international community must do its utmost to reverse, to help convince people in both Palestine and Israel that their interests are far better served by negotiation than by violence. I therefore welcome last week's intervention by UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon who acknowledge the real anger and fear on both sides, but emphasise that only returning to the peace process can prevent the current crisis from worsening. In terms of the Scottish Government's uh, own action, actions, which a number of members have raised and questioned, uh, we've consistently condemned obstacles to progressing the peace process, like the continued expansion of illegal settlements. And we use that term deliberately. We view the settlements as illegal. Uh, we have strongly discouraged trade and investment from legal settlements in last year, published guidance for public purchasers on dealing with companies that may be involved in legal settlements. We Cara Hilton asked about our procurement guidelines. That is certainly one step uh, in the right uh, direction. We've also directly supported the people of Gaza. Last year, we gave half a million pounds to the UN Gaza Flash Appeal to help to provide water, food, shelter and medical assistance. Uh, we stood ready to provide medical assistance as well and put in place uh, plans for casualties of violence in Gaza to receive specialist care in Scottish hospitals. While doing that, uh, what we can within the limitations of our devolved competence, we've also repeatedly called 
on the UK government to use its influence to help relieve the suffering in Palestine, whether by taking in refugees or indeed calling for uh, a ban on exports of arms to Israel. And that includes, uh, I should say, to, to John Finney and to Cara Hilton, uh, those companies that would be based uh, in Scotland. In terms of the comments... Uh, well, I'm about to address his point on Lockheed Martin, if he wishes uh, me to do that, um, because I thought his points were well made. I don't know 100% uh, uh, about the issue, but I think a criticism uh, may well be fair enough that, of course, as a government, we would strive to do our utmost uh, in terms of the highest standards of ethical business. And if there's still work for us to do in that, then I'm more than happy to discuss that uh, with the member. Uh, within Scotland, uh, the Scottish Government does not tolerate violence or extremism in any form. Uh, just as we condemn it in Israel and Palestine, we condemn it here in Scotland when it's directed to any of our own Palestinian, uh, Israeli, Jewish or Muslim uh, communities. Uh, we all hope, uh, Presiding Officer, for peace in Israel and Palestine, but the anger and frustration that fuels much of the current violence will not subside unless there is hope for a better future. It's hard to see how such hope can exist when the conditions in Gaza described in this UN report make the prospects for the people of Palestine so bleak. We urge all sides to work together to bring an end to the violence, to allow the people of Gaza and wider Palestine to build the kind of prosperous future so vital for a long-term sustainable peace. I think Cara Hilton said it well when she said this is not an issue of being pro-Palestinian or pro-Israeli. This is about being pro-human rights and pro-international uh, law, and that is where the Scottish Government lies. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And that concludes Sandra White's debate as Gaza withers its people perish. And I now close this meeting of Parliament.